We're here for another interview of Brewview. We are at Odd Breed Wild Ales in Pompano Beach. And I'm here with Matt. Hey, how are you? Good, Matt, thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. So Matt, tell us, what got you started with beer? Uh, well, I started back in, uh, I guess it would have been 2005. Okay. Um, I was in college, I was studying microbiology, and I started home brewing and uh, Ended up really liking it and decided to do an internship at a brewery, a brew pub actually up in Pennsylvania okay. over the winter holidays. And that's kind of what really cemented my interest in wanting to be a professional brewer. And uh, I pretty much just dove in head first and I haven't really looked back since then. Okay. So did you pr pursue anything in the industry of microbiology or you just kept going with the beer? So I actually uh, was originally a health science major okay. in school, and I changed my major to microbiology halfway through my freshman semester, okay. uh, first freshman semester, just because I, I thought, why not? Uh, you know, beer sounds cool. This, at this time, there weren't really many breweries, uh, craft breweries, at least on the on the east coast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was aware of the the microbrewery scene out in California, um, but I was living in South Carolina. I was going to Clemson University. At that time, we had a cap on the alcohol limit in beer. Uh, okay. It was 5% alcohol by weight. South Carolina is one of the last states in the country to still uh, set their alcohol regulations really? based on alcohol by weight. And uh, so 5% alcohol by weight equates to about 6.2% alcohol by volume. Okay. So Interesting. there were a lot of breweries, uh, especially out, out on the West Coast, that we just couldn't get in South Carolina because they had really no interest in just shipping some of their portfolio out to, to South Carolina. Okay. You know, if you look at, at a brewery like Stone, for example, is one of the, the one of the big, more popular breweries back in 2005. They didn't make a lot of products that were under 6.2% right. ABV. Interesting. So they didn't they didn't have any interest in distributing to South Carolina. So, you know, my my uh, real go-to craft beers back then were Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Anchor Liberty Ale, um, Sam Adams Boston Lager. You know, those were really about the the most exciting beers that I could get back then. Yeah. So the just the the concept of being able to homebrew, and uh, even though I wasn't 21 yet uh, <laughs> you know I, I found found some ways around that I had I had uh, friends you know that would help me with purchasing ingredients and all that uh, as long as they could drink the beer of course so it, it was uh, kind of an outlet for me to um, be able to explore a little bit beyond just the beers that I could get in South Carolina at that time I didn't know anyone else at homebrewed uh, you know this is long before you had brewery podcasts and and YouTube homebrew channels uh, so I, I just I read a lot of books and uh, figured out how to homebrew and so being able to then eventually do an internship at a, at a actual working production brewery and uh, and see how things work in the real world with with crafting beer on a, on a larger scale uh, was really eye-opening and, and like I said it also really just cemented my interest in the industry and I haven't really looked back since then. So when you first started before you were 21 years old tell me about your brewing setup. Uh, it was pretty basic. You know, I, I started with uh, just an extract kit. Uh, I think the way that most people do. You know, I didn't have a lot of money because I was in college. So I think it was like a like a sixty seventy dollar kit. Okay. And uh, the first beer that I made was a um, uh, basically an American porter, but I changed it around a little bit by dry hopping it. Uh, I think I added Chinook or Cascade and. Um, and then I also added honey to it to again boost up the ABV a little bit because I was 19. <laughs> that's what you want to do. Exactly. And, exactly. Uh, but I, I think I did three or four uh, homebrews with with just that that extract kit, just a really really kind of basic setup. And um, the beers were actually okay. I was I was kind of surprised. My first beer was actually <laughs> better than the following two. Okay. And All right. uh, and I think that a little bit had more to do with with just recipe design and and you know when you're when you're home brewing, especially when you're when you're brewing with extracts. Uh, and I was, by the way, still using some, some grain, but I, I wasn't using all grain at that point. And uh, the darker beers tend to be more forgiving. So first couple of beers that I brewed were, were decent. You know, they were drinkable enough. Um, started getting a little bit better, and then I felt like I, I had kind of plateaued and, and my beers weren't really improving. And so I think maybe the fifth or the sixth beer that I brewed um, was, was an all grain brew. And so that was... Um, uh, Pretty basic setup still, you know, it was basically a, a 10 gallon Rubbermaid cooler and, um, you know, had a, a stainless steel false bottom fixed in place. I was still boiling on my stovetop in the apartment. Um, <laughs> it, uh, uh, you know, wasn't OSHA regulated at all. I, I, had, I had multiple tiers, you know, I was using uh, uh, microbiology textbooks to kind of keep everything at the level that I wanted. Oh, wow. Um, Definitely uh, had to keep some some uh, some towels ready to go, you know, for spills. <laughs> but 
but it was fun, uh, and I, I learned a lot, and uh, you know, it was it was really cool to just be able to experiment and and uh, create things that I had never tasted before. That's that's really what just that that whole creative process really interested me. You know, I've, I've had a background in science. That's um, uh, you know what I what I enjoy uh, learning about, but but just kind of that fusion that brewing has of of history, uh, science, art. I, I think it's it's pretty unique in that sense. So fast forward 15 years, mm -hmm. you had your very basic kit. Yep. Tell me about your setup now. Well, I actually don't really quite have my own setup as far as a brewery goes. I mean, obviously I've got I've got this place, um, but. You know, we do all of our fermentation, all of our barrel aging, all of our packaging on site here. We've we've got the tasting room, so we can pour draft beer when uh, when we're allowed to open. <laughs> Obviously, that's an issue right now because of coronavirus. But um, I actually brew all my recipes over at Barrel of Monks Brewing Company. So okay. uh, those guys are actually my business partners. Um, they're about 20 minutes north of us here. So what I do is I, I clean and sanitize uh, a, a large 550 gallon stainless steel tank. I strap it onto the back of a trailer. I uh, drive up to Barrel of Monks with all my hoses, all my parts, uh, with that tank ready to go. And I, I basically go over there, I brew my recipes. Um, they have a, a pretty awesome brew house. In my opinion, they have the nicest brew house in South Florida, maybe in the whole state. And uh, the reason that it's, that it's so nice, well, several reasons, but really the, the reason that it's ideal for me and the kind of beers that I make is that it's a a uh, system that is step mash capable and it's also capable of decoctions and basically what that means is it allows me to bring the the mash uh, up to various different temperatures and activate or inactivate different enzymes and that just gives me a lot more control over the whole process it allows me to control the fermentability of the beer uh, which in turn is going to change the mouth feel uh, it's going to change even some of the flavors that i'm able to get from the beer and so it it, it really works ideally for me to be able to use their brew house in crafting these types of beers. Uh, it also allowed me to get started with a lot less money. Uh, you know, when you're working in the brewing industry uh, for over a decade like I have, you don't have any money because <laughs> the brewing industry doesn't pay very well. Even if you own your own brewery, you're still not getting paid that well. So uh, for me to be able to just focus on, on really our slogan, which is flavor from fermentation, just made a lot of sense. And so me having this, this long-standing relationship with the guys at Barrel of Monks. Uh, I've been friends with them for years, long before I, I even started working on this project. Uh, it, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to use their brew house. And like I said, we still have all of our own equipment here that we own, um, which is all of these barrels. These are all 500 liter barrels. They're all constructed of French oak. Um, they're all either from uh, wineries in Napa, California, or in Italy. Uh -huh. um, but they're, the barrels themselves are all constructed in France. And uh, so, you know, this is, this is really what we focus on here. So it's, um, it's a little weird in that, like I said, we are a little bit more of a fermentation project type okay. place. We do get some customers who come in and they say, where's your brew house? Right. I right. thought you guys made beer. And it's like, yeah, we do actually. These barrels aren't decorative. They are all full of beer. Yeah. Okay. You know, we have several thousands of gallons of beer in the building right here. Uh, but all of our products take a long, long period of time. And so it really made sense for us uh, when we got started to, to focus really just on, on the fermentation, on the barrel aging side of everything. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really where my passion is as okay. well. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful setup. Thanks. So what's your best seller? Uh, well, that kind of depends. So we don't really leverage a corner lineup, you know, the way that, that a typical brewery does. Uh, we do have one beer that we consider to be our flagship. It's uh, Saison. Okay. Uh, we call it Past and Future. And uh, it's, it's kind of our ode to uh, uh, very traditional farmhouse style beers from Belgium. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't that many breweries in Belgium that actually make beers quite this way anymore. Uh, a lot of the saisons that are that are now produced in Belgium and especially in the U.S. are uh, typically produced with with a single microorganism, which is you know just just a typical brewer's yeast strain. Um, but you know, long ago, uh, breweries in in Belgium and, and other farmhouse breweries. They focus more on mixed culture uh, fermentation, not necessarily on purpose, but what I mean by mixed culture fermentation is that you're using multiple strains of, of yeast, including wild yeast. There's also going to be bacteria in the process. Uh, some of that was intentional. A lot of it was because it was before um, you had pure culture techniques. Okay. Uh, this, you know, Louis Pasteur um, is where the, the name pasteurization comes yes, from. Yes. Uh, 
he was basically the father of microbiology. And okay. so he was the one who, con who discovered really that, that yeast is the agent of fermentation. Uh, and his studies, uh, everything that, that he really figured out regarding microbiology uh, really helped uh, clean up the wine industry. And then later, of course, also the brewing industry. And that was just because of the, this understanding of pure culture technique. What also went along with that is that a lot of these Belgian farmhouse breweries, they, um, they kind of lost their identity to a certain extent. They lost what made them unique. And uh, our, our past and future Saison is almost an attempt to try to get back to those days where you had beers that were made with, with multiple microorganisms. I believe that they featured more complexity. Um, our, our beer, past and future Saison, is brewed like a, like a Belgian Saison, more or less. It's 5% alcohol by volume, so it's, it's not a heavy beer. It's not drinkable. meant to be overly alcoholic, exactly. It's meant to be thirst quenching, drinkable, refreshing. It's highly carbonated, it's very dry. Uh, it does have some acidity, which I think makes it more thirst quenching, but it's also bottle conditioned, like all of our beers are, uh, with our mixed culture of wild yeast and bacteria. It has a very good shelf life. But um, again, that's that's what we consider to be kind of our, our flagship. But yet, we've only released three batches of it yet. Okay. You know, so and we've been in business now for uh, for almost three years. So, okay. that's that's the only beer that we've released three batches of. Um, everything else we've released either as a as a one off, um, or we've released two batches, okay. and that's it. We I believe last year we made something like sixty something different beers. Wow. Um, in total, since we've been open, we've produced like 130 different beers. Wow. So it's, um, we're, we're constantly, you know, kind of changing things up. There are certain base recipes that I brew. So when I go to brew at Barrel of Monks, you know, I, I brew 550 gallon batch. It's, okay. a, it's a large batch. It's about 18 and a half barrels. Um, that's larger than most of the breweries in South Florida. Yeah. Um, but we can take that one batch. I'll fill up four of these large barrels. These are 132 gallons each. And then I'll also typically fill up one of these uh, standard size wine barrels. And uh, from those, those different barrels, I can create different blends. I can uh, re-ferment beers with fruit. Uh, I only use fresh fruit. I don't use any concentrates or purees or extracts. That's one of the things that I think makes us unique. Uh, if I'm gonna age a beer in barrels for one, two, or three years, I don't wanna use uh, a product like aseptic puree. Okay. That's, that's essentially like a, like a dumbed down version of fruit. I wanna okay. use fresh fruit where I can get that full flavor out of it. So. By, by having multiple barrels to blend with, I've got uh, mul multiple uh, stainless tanks as well that I can use to add fruit in, or I can add dry hops, I can add different spices or herbs. I don't do a whole lot of that, but it's something that I've been experimenting with a little bit more. So, you know, the, just, just uh, really the creative side of this is, is really what kind of gets me excited. And uh, by having multiple different vessels to work with, it allows me to, to create a, a lot of different products from just one different beer. Okay. What is your favorite beer to make or to drink? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I've I've really been enjoying a lot of our uh, lambic inspired beers. Okay. Um, so I, I don't call our beers lambic. Um, I've been kind of struggling with exactly what I should call them. What is lambic? So lambic is uh, a type of spontaneous beer fermented in a uh, produced in a certain part of Belgium. Uh, it has to be within a, a certain. Um, uh, geographic area, and I, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it has to be within a certain part of Belgium that's near the Seine River Valley, which is basically smack dab in the middle of the country. And uh, because it's a spontaneous beer, it, it uh, is influenced by the microbes that are in the air, and uh, it can only be produced certain months out of the year as well. It, it's uh, basically beer's version of terroir. Uh, you know, it's, you're not going to be able to produce that type of beer that tastes like Belgian Lambic outside of that certain particular region of Belgium. Okay. And you can get somewhat close, you can approximate some of the flavors, um, but it, it's a protected appellation just, just as champagne is. Okay, uh, I understand. So a lot of the techniques that we borrow are, are you know, techniques that began in the, in the Lambic industry. Um, Lambic has been produced for, depending on who you talk to, there's, this is actually pretty heavily disputed now, oh. but it, Lambic has been, been produced for around 200 years, and uh, it's considered to be the oldest type of beer that's still being made today. And uh, it, it just, it, it, it has a certain complexity to it, a certain depth that I, I just don't think exists in other styles. Uh, the production process is very labor intensive. Okay. Uh, to give you an idea, when we brew a, a normal batch of beer, uh, that's not one of our lambic inspired beers. It's basically about a 12 to 14 hour uh, work day for me. Wow. Um, it's already a very long day. Right. When right. I produce uh, one of our lambic inspired beers, it's basically an 18 to 20 hour day. Oh so my uh, I'm exhausted. You know, it's, right. just, it's a very intensive process. 
uh, you know, I have to wake up really early. I get all my equipment ready to go, drive up to Barrel of Monks. Wow. They actually already get some of the uh, the stuff ready to go for me, just so that my day isn't 24 hours long. Okay. And uh, but it's it's a it's a labor of love. You know, there's there's just there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, the beer takes a very long time to to then age uh, and and properly you know finish fermentation as well. Um, so it's it's not a, a quick process at all. We haven't done a, a lot of batches of our lambic inspired beer yet. I think we're up to six or seven now. Um, but I've been very um, uh, surprised, pleasantly surprised, by the results that we've had thus far, mm -hmm. and it's uh, they've been good enough to to make me say, okay, yeah, it's worth all this work. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of brewers that that would argue with me that oh, uh, you know, it's not worth all the, not this all the effort time. or this time that you're putting in. I know that there are some other breweries that exist within our niche that make barrel aged wild ales, okay. and they do much shortened versions of this process, and I. While those beers are good, I still feel like they're they're missing just a little bit of something, and I, I feel like uh, the process of, of uh, lambic production, specifically what's called a, a turbid mash, um, it's very energy intensive. It requires multiple steps. Um, it's the only beer that I brew that I print out about three pages of instructions because okay. it's it's actually that detailed of a process. Okay. okay. And uh, maybe I won't need to do that once I, I brew a dozen more of these batches. But um, you know, most most beer is produced pretty similarly in the brew house. Okay. Uh, these Lambic inspired beers are produced with a very different process. It relies on this specialized equipment, which Barrel of Monks has. Okay. And uh, it, like I said, it just, it produces a unique product that I don't think can be replicated with other methods. And okay. so uh, it's also the beers that I produce that age for the longest period of time in barrels. So we're, we're talking about anywhere from one to three years. Okay. And after that, the beers are blended, then they need to go into a bottle or a keg, and then they're naturally conditioned for anywhere from about four to eight months. So it's it's a very long process to make one of these beers. You know, what's the longest one that's been in here? Uh, so we had a uh, barley wine um, that we had on draft, and that had been in barrels uh, just a little over three years. Wow! And uh, I did that beer on draft only, uh, in part because it was just a, it was a smaller size barrel, okay. and I didn't have a lot of volume of it. I also lost a lot of volume from Angel Share, and yes. so Angel Share is just the the evaporation that you get out of the barrel as as the liquid is aging, and so uh, the beer was was very full bodied, very viscous. It is a wild barley wine, so it okay. still has the inclusion of our our mixed culture wild yeast and bacteria. It had a little bit of acidity to kind of cut through some of that sweetness, but uh, overall, just the the complexity, the depth of that kind of beer was was off the charts. Uh, wow. People really liked it. Okay. Do you partner with any restaurants or food trucks to bring in food to the brew room when people can come in here and drink? Sure. So we we have. Um, you know, we uh, it, it kind of depends on the day of the week. Um, on days when we know that we're going to be more busy, uh, when we have a bottle release, for example, or if we uh, we used to do bottle shares here monthly. Okay. And so uh, when we did that, we would we would typically have a food truck come in. Um, we've also uh, worked with a couple of our friends um, and and had them you know cater some food for us, okay. things like that. But uh, but yeah, we, we do have some connections in the restaurant industry. Um, we're we're working on uh, whenever COVID ends, um, we are sending more beer out into distribution locally. Okay. Uh, we have been sending beer out to distribution a good bit uh, throughout the states okay. and then also internationally. All right, tell me more about that. How how are you distributing? Are you bottling it, sending it out? Yep. Yeah. So we have another warehouse uh, that's about three miles from here, okay. and we use that warehouse uh, almost exclusively just for aging our bottles. Okay. So. Uh, once we, we package our beer into bottles and kegs, it's then naturally conditioned, which means that we're not force carbing it. We're not adding CO2 into the okay. product the way that typical breweries do. You can carbonate a beer in you know a couple hours if you really want to. If you really right. want to, actually, you can carbonate it in about 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, we don't we don't do it that way. Our uh, our process is a little bit more like champagne, and that it's actually it's it's refermented in its package. Uh, so we add a little bit of of sugar depending on the beer that we're making. That could be uh, either organic cane sugar if we're just looking for for no flavor contribution from that sugar source. Uh, other times we've added different varietals of local honey. Uh, we've also added organic blue agave nectar. So there's different ways to accomplish uh, the refermentation in the bottle or the keg. But uh, but once we, we package the beer in bottles or kegs, it then needs you know months before it's then ready to sell. Okay. And so uh, we'll we'll ship all of our beer out from our warehouse, and uh, we work with uh, with two distributors in the state of Florida uh, that cover us statewide. Okay. Uh, we have a distributor in Georgia. Uh, oh, we cool. have a distributor in Vermont. We're working on uh, setting up distribution in California, oh, wow. uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee, uh, as well as New York. Um, 
and then we sell internationally to China and Sweden. Really? And we're also uh, getting ready to set up a, a distribution in the UK. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Do you sell to liquor stores or do you sell to bars? Uh, it really depends. So, I mean, to a certain extent, that's that's up to uh, to the distributor uh, where they want to place our product. Um, with the the format that we package our beers in, you know, 750 milliliter bottles, uh, 375 milliliter bottles. Uh, we've packaged one beer in a 500 milliliter bottle. We're not selling in six packs. We're not selling in you know 12 packs cans or okay. something like that. So, uh, for the most part, we're we're not really uh, the type of product that I, I believe belongs in in a liquor store. Um, but it really just depends on the location. You know, there there are some uh, liquor stores that have an awesome beer selection. Yeah. Um, we're uh, we're hoping to be in the uh, the liquor stores in Sweden uh, okay. later this year. We've sent them kegs a couple times, and uh, we're going to be sending them some bottles this fall. Uh, their bottles, uh, when we send them bottles, they'll they'll be sold at their state-run liquor stores, and that's okay. just as all their beer is. So, you know, it it really kind of just depends on the location. Uh, for the most part, our our product does best. I, I believe it's it's uh, best positioned to sell well uh, to to be in the hands of the right clientele. If it's at a, a like a boutique uh, beer shop, so, so it really who's your customer. Um, you know, it, it's all different types of people, really. Um, it we've seen uh, you know men and women in their twenties all the way up to uh, guys in their sixties, seventies. You know, that like our product. Um, it it kind of depends. It's it's a it's a little bit of an interesting cross section. We've noticed that compared to most breweries, we actually have more female drinkers. Interesting. And uh, I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that our our production process, and then of course, most importantly, the way the beer tastes is is in a lot of ways more similar to wine than typical beer. I agree. Uh, it is typically more light bodied. The high carbonation, the light acidity, a lot of times is somewhat reminiscent of wine. And then, of course, obviously the fact that we're aging in wine barrels, yeah, we yeah. do we do get some carryover of flavor from uh, the previous contents in that barrel, which being wine, we have you know different types of wine barrels too. So a lot of times, you know, we'll we'll make one batch of beer, split that up into three or four different types of barrels, and then release the beer all together in part so the customers can see, okay, this is what is contributed by a Pinot Noir barrel. This is what a Shiraz barrel tastes like. This okay. is what a Sangiovese okay. barrel tastes like. I hear you. And I, I think that's kind of a, a, a cool outlet for us as well to be able to experiment, but also to, to kind of highlight the fact that, you know, the, the beer that we make isn't, isn't like typical beer. It, it's really a, a beverage that's a little bit of a, a, a cross section of, of different industries, especially the, the wine industry. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of the, the techniques that we borrow are, are from the wine industry. Obviously, I've, I've studied a lot about beer. Uh, I went to brewing school in Germany as well. That but, was my um, next question. <laughs> but, uh, Tell us about that. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, so I, I knew I wanted to go to brewing school after I, I studied microbiology. Uh, I got a job at Thomas Creek Brewery in Greenville, South Carolina. They're a, a production brewery. And uh, I started there as the assistant brewer, eventually worked my way up to head brewer. And I knew that I wanted to get a little bit of real-world brewing experience uh, in a commercial setting uh, before I went to brewing school. And part oh. of the reason for that is just that when you go to brewing school, uh, you get inundated with, with so much information. And uh, it, it's important to be able to be able to pick out those tidbits of information and say, I can apply this in my brewery. Uh, if not, you're, you're just going to be um, overwhelmed with, with the amount of information presented to you, and you're not going to really know what is important and what you should focus on. Uh, brewing is all about compromises. Okay. And uh, a lot of people look at that as, as a dirty word, but the, the fact is, you know, if you want to choose the ideal pH for your mash, uh, considering your protein degradation, that's 5.8. Well, at a pH of 5.8, your pH is going to be too high for other processes. So it's, it, in all of brewing, whether it be from mashing, fermentation, cleaning, everything, is there's always a little bit of a compromise involved. And okay. you have to figure out what is really important, what you want to focus your energy on, what variables you absolutely have to control, okay. which ones you neglect, and which ones you're aware of, but you're not going to obsess over. And so, so going to brewing school after I had some really real-world brewing experience, I felt like was very important. I also wanted to go to brewing school in Germany because they have a much more uh, engineering type approach. Cool. Uh, the beer that I make here, uh, maybe ironically, is, is not as much of an engineering approach okay. as typical beer. Because again, I, I'm relying a little bit more on techniques from the wine industry. It's, uh, there's a lot more art and creativity involved. Uh, but at the base, you know, brewing is a science. And so I wanted to go to, to Germany. I wanted to study uh, the way that they produce beer there, learn from their techniques, figure out how I could apply them, those techniques, the ones that I felt were most important in my brewery. 
and uh, and also get get a little bit more of an international perspective on brewing. Uh, you know, working at a brewery in the U.S. is great, right? But at the same time, the the time that you spend around people is uh, is going to, you know, their, their ideals, their processes, their techniques are going to rub off on you. But you may not be aware of the way that everything, everybody else around the world is producing their beer, the way that they, um, you know, get inspiration, what they think is important. And so I really wanted to be able to get that kind of international perspective. And that's something that I was able to get in, in Germany. I lived there for seven months in Berlin okay. and uh, studied brewing and malting science. Um, actually studied a lot of malting science, which I, I wasn't previously all that familiar with. If I weren't getting into brewing, I think I probably would have wanted to get into malting. It's, okay. uh, it's, a, it's a very cool uh, industry as well. I think, there's, I think it's overlooked by most brewers. And I think having a better understanding of the ingredients that you're working with is very important. And uh, that's, that's something that's, that's definitely overlooked by a lot of brewers that simply open up a catalog or go online and say, okay, I'm going to order some of this grain. I'm going to order some of this hop. <laughs> I like this hop because it tastes like grapefruit, you know, and, and that's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But, you know, if you understand a little bit more about, about your ingredients, about your process, about why you're doing something a certain way, you can better coax out the flavors that you want. And you're going to end up with better results. Great. Great. Do you speak German? No, no. not enough. <laughs> so how did that work? Uh, I knew how to order a beer. Um, okay. <laughs> I knew how to ask where the bathroom was. Um, I, I could I could understand enough to try to get around, um, but it, you know I was I was fortunate in that it was an international university. Okay. Uh, so it was I went to VLB Versuchsun Lernstalt für Brauerei in Berlin, which means okay. Research and Teaching Institute for Brewers in Berlin. It's part of uh, TU Berlin, the Technical University of Berlin, and so it, it's basically. Um, held exactly on the you know the same campus it's the same professors that are at uh, tu berlin that are teaching all the brewing courses so it, it's a, it's an accredited institution um they have great facilities uh really cool labs you know we had a, a state-of-the-art pilot facility um it was fully automated you know it was it, it was really cool being over there and being able to see okay this is how you you produce beer in europe because they have a completely different process okay. and different mindset than we have in the u.s and the u.s breweries are built uh with this mindset of what you want to do next year and okay. in germany especially breweries are built with a mindset of what are we going to do 20 years from now what are we going to do 50 years from now uh, i remember going into very large breweries in germany and walking around and thinking are you guys closed today how is all this equipment still moving? Because right. you didn't see anybody working there. Okay. And it's because, uh, for the most part, a lot of their equipment is, is automated. Okay. So, you know, me working at a production brewery in South Carolina, and I'm working alongside seven guys, and we're, we're pumping out what I believe to be an appreciable amount of beer. We're doing about 10,000 barrels a year. Yeah, yeah. And then I go to a brewery in Germany that's putting out 200,000 barrels a year, and they have fewer employees than we do. Wow. Because they have more state-of-the-art equipment. Okay. They, have, they have bigger um, you know, bottling lines. Okay. They have automated uh, keg filling equipment. And so it's, it's just it, it's a different mindset. Like I said, it's, it's really it's, it's this, this long-term mindset of this is the way that you make beer. And... Sure, there, there's a very high capital investment, but at the same time, they're purchasing state-of-the-art equipment that does make better beer. You know, and the more the more things that you have to do manually in the brewery, not always, and there are some exceptions. One of which being the kind of beer that I make here. But for typical beer, you want that that mechanization. That's that's going to help improve your consistency, your quality. It's going to uh, mean that you're going to have a lower package oxygen content, okay. which is going to be a better shelf life. And so, you know, you can sure you can make great beer on a small scale. But if you're making typical beer styles, especially something like a, like a German Pilsner, you really want to have good equipment. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, Matt, we are here at your store in Pompano Beach or in your brew house. What, is this a brew house, brew pub? I, I call it the, the barrel room. The barrel room, yeah, okay. I mean, it's... <laughs> okay, we're in Pompano Beach. So tell me, how did you find this location? Why did you pick this location? Uh, we had been looking for, I guess, about two years or so bef before we found this spot. And uh, originally was looking up towards Boynton Beach. I was living in Delray at the time. Okay. And part of the reason I wanted to be in Boynton is just because there were other breweries around. Right. And uh, we knew that the city was more amicable towards breweries opening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, right now, just about every city wants a brewery because they, they see what, they, what it does for the local economy. Uh, breweries are a good thing. But... Back then, you know, not every city had that kind of mindset. So right, right. Uh, we began our search in Boynton, really just couldn't find the, the spot that we were looking for. And uh, we, we then started looking up towards West Palm. Then we, we started searching around Delray, found a spot that we really liked in Delray. 
didn't work out because of landlord issues. Okay. Um, again, there's just a lot of misunderstanding regarding what goes into a brewery and how they operate. And this particular landlord just didn't understand that. Gotcha. Um, so we eventually just kept looking farther and farther south. We found a spot that, uh, that's west of here uh, off of Sample Road. And, uh, and it was just your, kind of your typical industrial spot. And it could have worked for us. It was the first spot that we saw uh, that we knew could work for us, and the landlord was okay with us being there. And so we went over to, uh, to City Hall uh, to check on the zoning, make sure that, that everything was good to go before we put in uh, uh, an offer for, for leasing the building. And uh, we found out that apparently there was a church, I guess like 100 yards away, uh, which, which still kind of baffles me because this was in the middle of an industrial uh, yeah, plaza. Yeah, that is interesting. But, um, but apparently there was a church nearby, and, and so, uh, so we, weren't, we weren't allowed to be there. And uh, we had been speaking, of course, with a lot of the other brewers in the area. Um, we know a lot of the, the other guys. It's just kind of the way this industry works. It's a pretty tight-knit right. industry. And so uh, our, our friend over at 26 Degrees, Greg Lieberman, uh, mentioned this neighborhood to us. And he said, well, have you guys looked over at any of the spots in Old Town Pompano? And uh, we, we were like, no, what's, what's that? <laughs> and uh, so he put us in contact with the, the CRA, the Community Redevelopment Association. And uh, I think it was like the following day we, uh, we toured uh, this neighborhood. Okay. And uh, I think this was the second or third spot that they showed us. And within like, like 15, 20 seconds, I was like, yeah, this, this, this place could it. work. And, uh, what's the you know, our, so we're, we're at 2,500 square feet in here. Uh, not very big. Um, like I mentioned, we do have another warehouse. It's about 1,700 square feet. And uh, the combination of the two spots gets us up to um, the square footage that we need. But um, the reason that we really liked this building and the reason that it was so hard for us to find the right kind of spot is that, for one, we needed a place that had really good insulation. Uh, we needed a place that had good air conditioning. Uh, we have solid AC in place here. We keep uh, this building at 72 degrees year round. And that's really for, for the barrels. Sure, uh, sure. We need to have a certain humidity level. Uh, I don't want to have large temperature fluctuations, and I want the temperature to be low enough uh, to be good for the, for the long-term aging with the yeast and the bacteria. Uh, our building also faces north and south. So what that means is that we're not getting a lot of heat produced during sunrise or sunset from an excessive amount of light coming in. Uh, so all of those things combined were, were hard for us to find. And then okay. especially trying to find all those things in a place that was industrial, industrially zoned, um, that had adequate parking, that had a landlord that wanted us there. Right. And so uh, you know, when we found this spot, um, you know, no spot is perfect, but this was as perfect as we felt like we were going to find. And uh, after two years of looking and finally two finding years. a place of looking, you know, and, and finding a, a spot that we were like, okay, we could actually make beer here. Um, it, it was it was nice. <laughs> it was nice to be able to feel like we had, we had finally gotten to where we could get to that next step in the process. Wow, two years. Do you have generators in case the power goes out? I wish that we did. Uh, that's that's going to be the next big purchase. Yeah. Yeah, this, this time of year, uh, hurricane season always has me a little, a little anxious. Um, you know, last year we, we thought that we were going to get hit. Uh, right. Fortunately, we didn't. We mm -hmm. didn't even lose power. But I was, I was counting on us losing power, uh, I guess, about a week before the storm hit. So I was slowly moving our AC down. I think uh, by the time we closed everything up, boarded up everything, uh, I had it down to like 65 degrees in here. And, uh, and part of that was because I anticipated us losing power and the temperature climbing. So I got insulation panels that I put over all the windows. Okay. Um, I taped the doors shut, you know, wow. trying, to, trying to keep out every little bit of draft that could come in. And... Uh, you know, fortunately, one of the things that we have in here that helps our AC system not have to work so hard is all these barrels filled with beer creates a lot of thermal mass. And so that makes it somewhat um, uh, resilient and, and less subjective to extreme temperatures. Um, of course, the temperature will still go up, but, you know, if, if we lose power in here for a day and the temperature gets up to 80, my barrels aren't going to go from 72 to 80 in a day. Okay. They're going to go from 72 to maybe 72 and a half or 73. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, th these are, are thick staves on the barrels. Um, there's a lot of volume inside of there, so it that fortunately resists some of that temperature change. But, but yeah, hurricanes and uh, losing power are probably my biggest fear. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. I believe it, I'm sure. So you've touched on it a little bit, talking about how you use the wild yeast and everything. So explain to me, when it, how did you come up with your name, Odd Breed Wild Ales? Sure. So, um, I mean, the kind of beer that we make is a little bit of an odd breed in the, right, the beer right. world. Um, you know, most breweries are not making beer like this. Your, your typical brewery, uh, somebody like Heineken, for example, massive brewery, 
They have brewery locations all around the world. They want their beer to taste like Heineken at every one of those locations. Um, that's admirable. It's, uh, it's an astonishing feat that they're able to accomplish that. And, uh, but that's not what we're going for. You know, they're, they're using one strain of, of yeast that's purchased from a, a commercial lab. Well, in their case, they probably house their own yeast strain. But okay. the majority of, of breweries, especially microbreweries around the world, they purchase their yeast strain from, from a lab. Anyone has the ability to purchase it. It's not theirs. It's not really unique. And that's all for the goal of being able to produce your beer cleanly, um, uh, efficiently, but also consistently. And you want to be able to take that beer. And if, for example, you wanted to open a brewery in another location, you want to be able to take that recipe and, and make it taste it. exactly the same. And that's what somebody like Heineken does. Right. Um, we've really decided to go the complete opposite route and that our beer is made here. If I opened a brewery somewhere else, it's not going to taste exactly the same. Uh, because I feel like I have a good enough control over our process, I can make it taste pretty similar but it's never gonna taste exactly the same. And if somebody else opens a brewery and they say, eh, I wanna want make beers that taste just like Odd Breed, uh, my advice to them would be good luck. They're not gonna be able to make it happen. <laughs> and really the big part of the reason for that is that we have our own unique mixed culture of wild yeast and bacteria. Uh, there's at least 30 some odd organisms in the beer. Uh, it's not stuff that's just purchased from a lab. It's, uh, it's stuff that I've been cultivating that I've uh, kind of witnessed evolve and mutate over a period of, I guess, about seven years now. And so if somebody, you know, wanted to, to purchase, you know, those 30 yeast strains from a lab, uh, mix them together and, you know, try to make something similar to what we have, they're not going to be able to do it. Maybe they can do it in seven years after they, they get those strains to evolve and mutate. Uh, but really, it's just not going to happen the same way. We put selective pressure on our yeast and bacteria. We're harvesting our, our mixed culture from, from barrels, from beers that, we, that we're happy with. So I like to think that every time we produce a beer, that next beer is going to be even better. Right. And part of the reason is, again, just because we're teaching our, our yeast and bacteria what we want it to do. If, it, if we have a batch that doesn't turn out exactly how we want it to, then we're not going to reuse the, the yeast and bacteria from that, that okay. barrel. Gotcha. Uh, we'll, gotcha. we'll start over again. And so... In the brewing world, we're kind of an odd breed in that sense, in that we're we're not really going the the path. We're not we're not focusing exactly our efforts the same way as typical brewery. I get it. And uh, and that's I guess what makes us a little different. Interesting. How can we find you? Uh, so I mean, obviously we're selling beer here at the tap room uh, right now to go only. Um, we sell our beer online, also on our website, but because of Florida state law, we are not allowed to ship beer. Okay. Uh, we have to ship beer through a distributor. We can't ship directly to a consumer. Uh, that's one of the very unfortunate things regarding the laws in our state. Um, in my opinion, it really doesn't make any sense because I can order beers from Colorado and I can get them shipped to my doorstep. But I can't ship my own beer to customers in Florida or wow. to customers in Colorado or other states. So really the way to get our beer right now, uh, aside from our tap room, is going to be some of the um, uh, boutique beer, st beer stores around the state that have us. Uh, right now, because of COVID, uh, it's going to be harder to find our beer. I, I hope that that changes soon. But, you know, like I said, we're also statewide in Georgia. Uh, we're statewide in Vermont. Uh, we've sold beer in, in uh, Colorado and in Kansas, uh, internationally in Sweden and China. Uh, and hopefully some new markets soon. So awesome. right now, that's that's kind of the best way to try to find our beer. Gotcha. Um, we do allow proxies, uh, meaning that you know if you live out of state or or you know we get we have uh, fans that live over in Tampa or, or Orlando, they can log on to our website, purchase okay. our beer, and they can assign somebody else who lives closer to Pompano to pick up the beer for them. Oh, cool. uh, and we also give people up to a month uh, to be able to then come and pick up the beer. So we we try to make it easier on the consumer. Okay. All right. What about Instagram? Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do that. I'm no expert. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we do Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we don't do Twitter. I don't think a lot of breweries do Twitter. Yeah, but, I don't um, do Twitter either. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have some information on our website as well. Okay. So any final comments for us today, Matt? Uh, no, I guess the uh, main thing I would say is, uh, especially with everything going on in the world right now, uh, support local businesses. Um, you know, there are a lot of breweries that are really struggling right now. We've, we've uh, decided to kind of change and ad adapt our, our business model to the current conditions, and that is uh, trying to focus on sending beer to places that have uh, the coronavirus situation better under control. And so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're opening all these new international markets right now. Awesome. But uh, we're fortunate in that our beer ages very well. You know, we have a very long shelf life. Our bottles will last for at least five years. 
Uh, most breweries don't have that luxury. They have to right. sell their beer quickly. So I feel like we're better positioned than a lot of other breweries are. And, uh, and I'm confident that we'll weather the storm, but a lot of breweries won't. And especially breweries that are smaller, breweries that don't have a lot of uh, distribution, that rely on on-site sales, uh, it's gonna be tough for them to continue. So I would say uh, just my advice for consumers, if you, if you love a local business, a small local independent business, uh, support them, especially 100%, right now. absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Matt. We appreciate it. Everybody, absolutely. come get your to-go beer from Odd Breed in Pompano Beach. And once we're back open, come to the tasting room.